Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello, team, and welcome to Scream Something, Volume 18. My name is Emily, and I'm here with my co-host, Producer Neil. Hey, everybody. In Scream Something, Emily and I will be sharing our initial thoughts and reactions for the episodes of Season 4 that were released the last two Thursdays. There will be plenty of Aster in these episodes, but our team will be saving our deeper analysis for full episode breakdowns we have planned after the season finale. And... With all of that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily Ford. Hello, Megan. The titles for this week's episodes are Encounter Upon the Razor's Edge and Forbidden Secrets of Civilization's Past. I do have to say them both like that because of the exclamation points. Yes, you do. The release dates were April 21st and April 28th of 2022. And the in-episode dates were August 27th, 28th, and then flashbacks to 26. It's complicated. We'll get into it. The directors for this week's episodes were Christopher Berkeley and Vinton Hoyk. And the writers were Jim Krieg and Giancarlo Volpe as a writing team. And Greg Weissman. Just in time for your next mission. Episode 19 opens in Central City, where Bart is installing time travel components on Bioship for Saturn Girl and Chameleon Boy and insists on knowing what's actually going on with them. And on New Genesis, Macom demands the same of Lorzad. But after the credits, out in space, two Green Lanterns on their way to the peace conference on New Genesis receive a distress signal and discover Razor, a blue lantern that Kilowog recognizes floating in space. We will break down this stuff, I promise. In Supertown, before the summit can begin, Razor explains his situation to Kilowog, how a blue ring found him shortly after the Green Lantern, the animated series finale. I'll explain it later. How we get... (laughs) (laughs) That will be required for the other half on this uh, Zoom meeting. So, how he gave his Red Lantern ring to Metron for safekeeping, and how he lost hope over the course of his quest and has now returned to retrieve his old ring from Metron. Meanwhile, Forager is on a date with Forager. Cute subplot. And elsewhere, Saturn Girl and Chameleon Boy explain to Bart, well, Lorzad explains to Makam and Mantis how Druzad was inadvertently imprisoned in the Phantom Zone for a millennium after the fall of Krypton, and upon being released on parole in the 31st century, he led a rebellion against the United Planets, but was defeated by the Legion of Superheroes, who returned him and his followers to the Phantom Zone. <laughs> Druzad's son, Lorzad, then repeatedly tried to free his parents, eventually forcing the Legion to destroy the last remaining Phantom Projector to prevent his plans. So, Lore stole a time sphere and went back in time to kill Superboy to prevent the Legion from being formed so that they could never defeat and imprison his parents. So to fix that, Saturn Girl, Chameleon Boy, and Phantom Girl took another time sphere and pursued them through time. (sighs) Back in the present. The summit between the New Gods, the Justice League, and the Green Lantern Corps commences, and everyone refuses to help Earth. A cutback to the ongoing, air quote, lore drop reveals how our three Legionnaires prevented an attempted assassination of Superboy at the UN in Season 3, but failed to actually capture Lorzad. So, so now they just had, so now they have to follow and protect Superboy for the next 10 years, which they seemingly failed to do when Lore successfully planted the kryptonite bomb on Mars. On New Genesis, the conference is interrupted by Rocket getting a call from Noble about their son's parent-teacher conference. I don't know how that whole cell phone thing works. Meanwhile, Metron (laughs) tells Razor he'll return his red ring in exchange for his blue one. But after donning the red ring, Metron reveals to Razor that he took the ring to study it and has been feeding Razor false clues on his quest to eventually destroy his hope and force him to come back and give him the blue ring as well. This predictably and intentionally angers Razor, leading to a giant battle and interrupting both the Peace Summit and Forager's date. Eventually, Razor snaps out of his rage and is able to reclaim the blue ring. 
becoming a dual wielding blue and red lantern and is able to heal Forager, who was injured during the destruction. Afterward, Razor flies off into space to continue his quest for Aya. Meanwhile, Lord Zod explains that he's currently trying to find and retrieve the Phantom Zone projector from Metron's vault to release his parents from the zone a millennium early. And the Legionnaires finish explaining why they need Bart's help, and he reveals the newly installed Cosmic Treadmill on the Bioship. Episode 20 opens with Rocket trying to patch things up with Orion, turns out to actually be Macomb in disguise, and the information that he reads from the surface of Rocket's mind then leads to the Time Sphere crew going back in time to place a tracer on the Ruction cell so that they can track it to Metron's vault, which we saw in a previous episode. Meanwhile, in Star City, Garfield shows up for his therapy session with Black Canary, insisting that he's doing much better and he's ready to rejoin the Outsiders. And they'll explore whether or not that's true. Uh, the Peace Summit continues poorly before being interrupted by Bear, who greets old friends and offers his condolences for Connor's passing and talks about several many more things that have nothing to do with the Peace Summit. Two days in the past, the Time Sphere crew arrives in Metron's vault and begins searching for the Phantom Zone projector. In Star City, the therapy session continues until Garfield admits that he believes he's at fault for Connor's death. And... Back in the Phantom Zone, Druzad leads Connor to a dwelling made out of asteroids where all the other Kryptonian prisoners that are aligned with him welcome him into the family. It's fine. Yay. It's fine. In Metron's vault, Lorzad, Makam, and Mantis continue their search before being attacked by a cloud of red mist, which Lore identifies as a baby sun eater. At therapy, Dinah finally gets to the heart of things with Garfield as he explains why he feels responsible for not only Connor's death, but for the loss of all of his loved ones over the past decade, eventually culminating in him admitting that he is powerless and that he needs real help. In the Phantom Zone, the Kryptonians do a creepy little musical number and Drew Zod offers Connor a place among his group, which Connor accepts, kneeling before Zod. In a quick flashback to last episode, we see that when Razor punched Metron back through a boom tube, the Time Sphere crew attacked and subdued him, torturing him until he agrees to lead them to the Phantom Zone projector. However, the box he leads them to contains kryptonite, which depowers and subdues Lorzad long enough for Metron, Metron, long enough for Metron to call the Sun Eater and incapacitate the rest. Metron then boom tubes. Yes, Metron then boom tubes into the middle of the Peace Summit, shouting, Come with me if you want the entire galaxy to survive. Nothing ominous at all about this, don't worry. And back in the vault, Mantis, the true MVP, gathers enough of his strength to drag everybody back into the time sphere, go back in time one day earlier, and by searching through the boxes that are conveniently labeled for Krypton, locates the... The container containing kryptonite and, of course, discovers the Phantom Zone projector. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Let's get into everything. A couple things happened. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. So, before we start getting into this, everybody knows that the first of these two episodes that we're going to be talking about has a lot to do with Green Lantern, the animated series. So I have to ask you... What is what is your knowledge of Green Lantern the animated series? Did you watch Green Lantern? Did you not? You are going to be ve very pleased with this response. It is a grand total of zero. Okay. Uh, I have not watched a single episode. I mean, I know like to the sense that like it's being as big a fan of Young Justice as I have been, like it's in there to to know enough that I had to Google to make sure that Jason was Razor. Like, yeah, so that's zero. Big okay. old, big old zero. So you and me had very different perspectives on this episode. Oh, we yeah. Jumping into all of it. So what I will say up front is I know you are not the only one who didn't watch Green Lantern. I did, but I know a lot of people didn't. So I fully understand why some people didn't like this episode or felt frustrated about it because... Razor's plot has 
very little to do with the rest of the show as it currently stands. Who knows? Maybe it'll become important later. Maybe in another season or something, this might perfectly weave into everything and make everything make sense. But if you didn't watch Green Lantern, the animated series, there's a lot of going into this and being like, I have no emotional connection to this character. And there's no like, that's taking up such a large chunk of the plot. But there's also no like established main character also being woven into that to like, guide us the way that like in the first season like when the new gods show up superboy is also tagging along with them so that we care what's going on and here we just kind of get a whole little razor plot line with no context and so i totally get why that annoyed people why that annoyed some people i totally get why people who were big fans of green lantern the animated series were like this is the best thing ever and i also fully understand and sympathize with the people who are like, I've watched every episode of Young Justice and I have no idea what's happening in this episode because I didn't watch an entirely different show. (laughs) That is valid and I get it. But for me personally, because I did watch Green Lantern, the animated series, this one resonated with me and I was very like happy, teary eyed that whole morning watching it because I'm like, you're telling me I'm getting a hope affirming epilogue to a show that ended nine years ago that I never thought I'd get to see more from these characters. (laughs) Ah, uh, and I'll admit I haven't watched as far as I can remember, I haven't watched Green Lantern since it ended, but apparently space goth loves his AI girlfriend enough to search to the ends of space uh, to find her imprinted on my adolescent brain at 13 and never let go because I was immediately like, yes, of course. (laughs) I remember all of this. But I will say, to me, one of the things about this episode that I did really love about this plotline and how they incorporated it into the show and hearing everybody involved talk about it on Twitter really cemented all this for me was that Green Lantern and Young Justice came up around the same time, Invasion and the only season of Green Lantern both aired as part of the DC Nation block on Cartoon Network back in the day, and they both ended around the same time. And then we flash forward many years to Young Justice getting to come back, and they get to keep telling this story and everything, and Green Lantern doesn't. And while writing season four for Young Justice, they reached out to this other team of creators in a way that, to me as a viewer and watching how this unfolded and hearing people talk about it on Twitter, read a lot like, hey, we came back and you guys didn't. Do you want to come play in our sandbox for a bit? Do you want to tell another chapter of a story that you guys never got to finish? And I know I there was some talk of like it was Brandon's idea to make this happen, apparently, but like it was written by Jim Krieg and Giancarlo Volpe, who were the producers behind Green Lantern. The director, Christopher Berkeley, also worked on Green Lantern. They brought back Kilowog's voice actor and Jason Spizak, who plays Razor, was already there, obviously. And Giancarlo mentioned on Twitter that even some of the board artists from Green Lantern, namely Sam Liu and Tom DeRosier, I think that would be how I would pronounce that, uh, were also Green Lantern alumni. And they let this team play again. And showing that sort of kindness and generosity to your fellow creators in our weird world that we live in right now is just really touching to me of being able to go, hi, we got resources and we want to share something with you guys. We want to let you guys tell more of this story is really kind and generous. And I appreciate that as a person who creates stuff and appreciates the people who create stuff. It's nice to see, even if this didn't factor a huge amount seemingly into the plot line of this season or whatever, I appreciate that on a meta level of people just being kind to each other. Yeah, it's the so it's only one season. And so apparently I could have accomplished this in all the time that I spend consuming media that I could have easily accomplished this task, but I had not. But that is to say that they the season finale and series finale for Green Lantern coincides to the day with the se- the season finale of Invasion. I was like trying to remember. I couldn't remember if it was the same day, but the second you said it, I'm like, oh yeah, that was the day DC Nation ended. That was a whole, it was a whole thing. 
Yeah, and so I mean, it does it does set up a lot of lore, and it does make Metron the awful continues to make Metron the awful new god that he is, but also kind of accepted. Like it's okay. I'm just like, why are we letting Metron be this wild? Why is this? Stop it! Yeah. So for me, it was it was confusing. Just because, just because I had no context. Um, yeah, like you said, there and there was just a lot. Um, now that said, like I am a huge, huge Kilowog fan. Um, so, so in that personal regard, um, Kilowog is certainly me when I'm at work. You, you know how to basic. Well, here I wrote it down. Um, where was it? Want to know how to not get something done? Form a committee. Oh my gosh, I literally at work have a mug that says I survived another meeting that should have been an email. Yeah, no, it was great. It was really funny waking up and watching this episode because as it started, I was like, oh, it's Kilowog. And they got the same actor from Green Lantern. That's fun. And then they're like, oh, there's a distress signal. I'm like, oh, I wonder what this is. And then I'm like, wait, is a blue light? Is Razor? Razor is he? What's going on? I had no idea this was coming. Uh, I had... It was just wild to walk into this episode and just be like, go from, oh, that's a nice nod to Green Lantern to, oh, we're just, oh, we're just continuing Green Lantern. That's wild. I didn't know this was allowed. Yeah. And well, and I I think back to the um, when you had the Doom Patrol Titans go homage previously. So it's those kind of things. And I think. I think more than any other season, and I'm just saying, just saying this to, to with a big old umbrella. I think more than any other season, this season will be a lot better once it's all out, and I can just watch the whole thing. Yeah, I hear you. As a throwback to like previous episodes, with that in mind, like I remember during the magic arc, I kept being like, "Why are we learning all about Vandal Savage? I'm not that invested in this." And then it's like, "Well, it's because next." arc is about atlantis and you need to know about vandal savage's history so you know who this guy is and why he matters when he shows up in atlantis i'm like oh oh now that makes now that makes perfect sense i need to just trust that things are probably setting up for other things uh yeah which there i mean you've created crashing the mode with that with that thought but yeah i think that there's because we're we're so focused when we're I think we're more used to watching these bigger bigger things happen yeah. or like wider perspective and so which I I would wager we're we're destined to culminate by the end of the season but yes I was very confused but at the same time it was it was a whole lot of lantern stuff that we hadn't had previously and which has been talked about through all of this that one of the original pitches was like a more Green Lantern focused show. Very early, early pitches. No, that's but that's what I mean. And so like the idea that being able to dive more into the Lantern Corps is is really interesting. And I like I said, it all it all folds in there. It's just I think it's just jarring. A little jarring for those that that aren't aware on first watch. Valid. So to address some of your confusion and presumably some of the confusion of some people who listen to our to our little podcast and may may have just not watched Green Lantern because I get it, (laughs) especially if you were someone who came to Young Justice after it had originally aired. Like if you were someone who watched it on Netflix or found it on DC Universe or something like that, I fully see how people missed Green Lantern. Like if you watched it on TV back when it was first airing, like I did, it was just kind of like. Yeah, they're in the same hour long block. I'm going to watch both of them kind of thing. But to address some of that confusion, uh, one thing I will throw out there is Greg Weissman on Twitter repeatedly answered the question of people going, wait, does this mean Green Lantern is canon? His answer was that it is green, that Green Lantern, the animated series is Young Justice adjacent in the same way that things like the Green Arrow short that he directed are which I have always taken to mean that a similar series of events unfolded at some point somehow in Young Justice. The details may be different, but the overarching concept is the same, which makes sense. Uh, wanted to throw... Same what? with Catwoman Hunted. Yes, it, it, yes, yes. It has been deemed adjacent as well. One of the newer ones, Yes. So along those lines to cover some of these Green Lantern thoughts and maybe illuminate some things for you, Neil, uh, and others who didn't watch. Gilog shouting at Razor. 
about disappearing for four years is is perfect, both as a fan who watched both of them and seeing that conversation unfold, uh, hilarious, and also perfect on a meta level because four years implies that the Young Justice version of Green Lantern events happened like late slash post season two, if I'm remembering how math works, which is hilarious because that's when they were both airing on Cartoon Network. Also, I will say that I loved the design for Blue Lantern Razor that we only see at the beginning of the episode. And it was really funny after the episode aired, I kept seeing people kind of talking and asking about like, oh, who came up with the design? Who decided on giving him a hood? All of these kind of things. And I think nobody could remember, I, if I'm remembering correctly from Twitter, all of the people involved were like, I don't remember exactly who said it, but we all kind of liked it and we ran with it and we all collectively came up with the design and all that. And I kept thinking, I'm like, why does this look so familiar? Why did my brain not even like question this as the design? And then I remembered and saw people sharing on Twitter that back post Green Lantern, the animated series finale, there was many, many a Razor Blue Lantern fan art that all commonly had him in a hood for some reason. Like everybody kind of collectively was like, this is a good design choice. I think it was at least slightly inspired by some of the other Blue Lanterns we saw in that show. I can't remember exactly. It has been many years since I rewatched the show. I may never have rewatched it. But yeah, I thought it was funny. I was like, I've seen Razor with a Blue Lantern like hoodie <laughs> before. Why Why have I seen And I'm like, oh, right. So much fan art. So much fan art for it. And my next note, I will give some context to you, Neil, since you even asked me, how do I say Aya's name? Yes. <laughs> so the context, the very short story, the short version of the context, based on what I can remember, because again, I don't remember all of the details of this show because it's been so long, but I remember the broad strokes and I, of course, remember the broad emotional strokes. Aya was the AI on the ship that our Green Lantern crew was on that over the course of the season, relatively early on, like kind of starts her own little mini personal quest about figuring out kind of like if she's a person and what it means to be a person and if she counts as a person and that kind of concept that comes up in a, a lot of sci-fi of yep. an AI so advanced that it goes, Do I, am I am I a person? Uh, <laughs> but for kids uh, and it's a very complicated thing the show eventually gets to, into some stuff of like if I remember correctly she is also partially like just straight up Green Lantern energy which is a thing that is alive and a spirit so does okay, that mean yep. she's more alive like she isn't just code she is also this other thing all of this stuff also over the course of this season of that one season, her and Razor fall in love for reasons. <laughs> of course they do. Uh, it's complicated. It's good. Uh, this show, I have joked that this show, Green Lantern, the animated series, over the course of its one season, like starts off very like space fighty fights and eventually gets to like romantic space melodrama space opera. And it's wild to see that that journey that this show takes uh, because like Razor and Aya become the like core heart of the show and the plot by the end of it. They go from like, is this is this a thing? Are we all looking at this too hard to being like, no, this is the main focus of this series. And by the end of it, through a convoluted series of events uh, that I that involves some evil robots uh, and some other things, Aya ends up dying but with a question mark spoilers for a 10 year old show here uh aya ends up dying with a big question mark next to it because maybe she didn't die maybe she's out there somewhere maybe she just faded into space we can't really be sure and so the very end of the series is razor being like i'm gonna go see if i can find her and everybody going okay and he flies off into space and the last shot of the show is a blue lantern ring rising up into frame and following after him into space as he moves from rage into hope hope that he can find her again and that they can be in love uh somewhere in space as we all hoped they would be <laughs> cue 
10 million fan arts. So there's your context for what everybody is talking about this whole episode. <laughs> is that Razor has gone for four years trying to find his AI girlfriend who faded into space. And now he's here because he's mad about it. Because he's sad. Whoa. <laughs> Do you have questions? No, it's just like that. Yep, that changes how a person might watch this episode. <laughs> you might go, oh, I guess, I guess now I know what's happening. Yeah. I literally, I will say the extent to which they avoided saying Aya's name for so much of this episode, genuinely the first time through for like three quarters of the episode, I was like, I wonder if there was some weird legal thing of like they weren't allowed to say her name or something like that. And then it, the very end they do say when he goes he's like i will find you i uh, as he flies off into space yeah and after i had like gotten over all of my heart being so happy yay this character's emotional connection very joy i was like that must have been real confusing for anybody who didn't watch green lantern and i think some of that uh confusion for people who didn't watch it could have been avoided or some of the emotional context of the episode could have been made a lot stronger for non Green Lantern fans if they'd included some at least slightly clearer references to what his quest was earlier on. Because even by the end, if you don't know who Aya is, you still don't know what his quest is by the end of the episode. And I feel like if they had had even some reference, if Kilowog had been like, did you find her yet? Like even just like one or two lines, like even if they didn't want to use her name early on, even just being like some reference to Razor is looking for person who is lost would have made some of that emotional context mean more. Because if you don't know what his quest is, you're like, he could be looking for anything. He could be trying to do anything. We have no idea why he's so mad. But if you know why everything's going down, you're like, yeah, no, this makes perfect sense. Thoughts? Thoughts from the person who didn't watch Green Lantern? Uh, no, it does make more sense. I mean, I think, yeah, because like I, I didn't really have the context for what he was doing or or why, but at the same time, like I have enough Green Lantern knowledge to understand the, the difference of the colors and yeah. why a person w would do that and have them. And then it's certainly interesting uh, to see someone obtain two rings, uh, not there is a lot of context for that in the sense that also like when Razor says at the end, tell how I said hi, like one of the one of the most notable instances where someone had a red and then a blue was Hal Jordan. Um, basically, the only way to stop the rage is to give someone hope, um, because the reason he says like it feels like poison, apparently the red supposed and I'm not saying it's true of Earth 16. I'm just saying it's general potential is that it turns your blood into like this plasma <laughs> and that's why it hurts when you get the rage ring basically and for the most part you can't just take it off uh because now you're coursing plasma through yeah. your body so uh for additional context the part of the thing why he says tell hal i said hello is hal is also is the main green lantern of the green okay. lantern animated series also it was interesting seeing some people talk about they're like Razor doesn't seem that rageful in general for most of this. And like, that's an interesting thing to point out, especially since having one, it's because he's moved a bit toward hope, but also it's because even in the original series, his kind of rage personality more manifested as this kind of, I am angry because if I am not angry, I will just be sad kind of thing because he becomes a Red Lantern after his home and family gets decimated in a war, uh, and he is so distraught by that all of those events that a red lantern ring appears to him, and he takes it as a way to feel some sense of control in a world in which he is powerless. So he is always that kind of slightly monotone, sarcastic, uh, not having a good time kind of lad, because he's only angry, because if he wasn't angry, he'd just be sad all the time uh yeah get that boy a therapy session with black canary and also find his ai girlfriend yeah but yes what else the other thing i will say i promise i have things about this things to say about this episode that aren't just about <laughs> razor but he was the main plot of this episode and 
Space Goth loves Robot Girl. Um, so, <laughs> for again, if you don't have Green Lantern, the animated series context, part of the reason why I reference this a little bit, but part of the reason why seeing Forager and Forager and seeing Forager get hurt and be held by other Forager is what snaps Razor out of being a rage monster is because, again, spoilers for a 10-year-old series, in the last episodes of Green Lantern, the animated series, Razor literally holds Aya as she dies and he can't do anything about it. So, of course, seeing two people who care deeply about each other in a very similar pose is him's brain being like, oh, wait, oh, no, I've done the bad. I gotta, I gotta dial it back. Gotta go be hope. Um, and then I'm gonna make two statues of them. That was not how it was. Um, but also, I think this is my final. Uh, this is my final razor thought, and then I'll talk about other things from this episode. I'm just grouping it all together so that you can get through me talking about how Green Lantern imp- uh, imprinted <laughs> on my brain. Razor has a magical girl transformation sequence, and that is very funny oh, to me. It's uh, true. It's like it's. I saw. I saw a couple people joke about it when I rewatched it. I'm like, it does. It does. Like the like stretch out arm costume appears across arm, head back, flowy hair, sparkles. Yep. I'm like amazing. But I do. And while like I know some people are like, you can have two rings, and what does this mean? And all of the like. In lore, how does this work kind of questions. I like, on the metaphorical level, the acknowledgement that hope and rage can coexist simultaneously and actually fuel each other toward purposeful, meaningful action. Uh, I like that concept, especially, you know, it's a time. Uh, And I appreciate that idea that you do not have to let go of being mad about things to feel hopeful about creating change and a better world. That's a good little metaphor, even if some people might have questions about how it works in universe. Well, yeah, and then a blue can enhance the power of a green, and at one point somebody has all seven and becomes a white. I mean, it's there. I mean, yes. Uh, yes. In Green Lantern, the animated series, they added some additional powers to Blue Lanterns so that they weren't just, like, buff spells, uh, (laughs) so that they could do other things, too, a little bit. That I know, depending on the continuity, sometimes, like, the only thing Blue Lanterns do is just stand next to Green Lanterns and make everybody more powerful. So You can do it! (laughs) Yeah, I can't remember all of the details of what it was, but uh, GLTAS added... uh, some other stuff around what hope does, <laughs> including healing, obviously, but like that kind of thing. So other stuff that happened in this episode that wasn't Razor. Well, I mean, p- part of it was nice that like we we add Bart back into what I t- alliteratively titled Team Time Travel. And it makes sense, though, not to engage because it, I don't know all of the rules for this time travel. So like clearly he's from a time that isn't their time would be my assumption. So like going to him is, is at this point just as much of a risk as going to anyone else, but he's a marginally less risky person to go to because he's from a kind of future, not as far as they are. So it's just fun to add, (laughs) to add Bart. But at the same time, I get why they wouldn't have up until this point, like, we, we don't know what else to do. We've got a busted time sphere, but we've got pieces and a functioning bioship. Do you think you could? Okay, cool. Also, the treadmill thing, that's a super common Flash-based tool um, to leverage his speed via a treadmill to power something. Um, so, Are you telling me that we have for decades in comics been going, what if you put the fastest man ever on a treadmill? Yeah, so it did. I didn't bat an eye when he when he was like, "Yeah, I've got this treadmill that I installed." I'm like, "Yep, that sounds right." I no, like I got. I was like, "Sure, that superhero science." But my first thought was, "I was like, but what is it? What does it do? What are you doing with it? Where are we yeah. going?" <laughs> well, I don't wonder if it's like whatever, whatever. Oftentimes, it's whatever powered their time sphere. I assume Bart is now the power. Uh-huh. Um, because literally in like the, the Arrowverse to halt 
the like crisis on infinite earths literally the like jay garrick just like stands there and runs on a treadmill to like help stop things so common use i also i forgot to write this down but i do love that bioship that they're just like we just asked if she wanted to help and she said yes (laughs) yeah i thought i was going into retirement but not really instead (laughs) i'm gonna travel across time and space bioship is like I wanted a nap, but you know what? I can't say no to to a band of misfit teenagers showing up and being like, hey, we we need a ride to an adventure. She's like, ah, that's what I do. I carry misfit teenagers to adventure. Well, then we also, during the lore dump, we also get the look at um, both Lightning Lad and Brainiac 5 as part of that group that was trying to battle with Lorzod. Um, but they were not covered in timey wiminess and brought along yes in uh what is it is it uh chronoton radiation <laughs> yes yes there it was oh uh, it you know science science other things that i have for this episode that aren't green lantern related i get that we're trying to set up rocket as not being able to like fully understand or commit to figuring out everything going on with her son but i will say it's and it's probably leading up to some sort of growth moment of some kind by the end of this arc i assume i assume we're going to figure out this subplot but noble calling her when he knows that she's in an intergalactic peace summit meeting with news that is clearly not an emergency is is not super chill i'm like wait for like an end of the day check-in please uh (laughs) If this was a super duper emergency, if that child was going to the hospital or something like, yes, you immediately call everyone involved. You make sure people are informed. But just being like, hey, everything's fine. And I just wanted to talk about this not immediate emergency thing. It's like she is trying to bring peace to the galaxy. (laughs) Please give her give her 10 minutes to do her job. (laughs) Well, it's hard to tell what time it is when you're. um on an entirely different world. You know. I understand that there are questions about it, like how cell phones work and across multiple planets. Superhero science is the answer. But like, I feel like we should, there should have been some sort of scheduled check in time uh, that was arranged. If I can juggle, if I can juggle time zones to b- make a podcast happen, we should be able to juggle time zones across planets in this superhero world. <laughs> Is what I'm just saying. I know some. Be- I know a lot of people thought it where they're like, "I get what we're going for here," but man, she's working. Could <laughs> could could we not have uh, just waited? Don't call me. I'll call you. Yeah, like just be like, I will call at the end of the day. <laughs> so I do. It. So we've already had mother boxes. We've had father boxes. But my thing is like this Kaiser Thrall thing is somehow more terrifying than <laughs> both of them, and like. I, I don't know if it, it just feels like it has more malintent than the other two. It's it's just scary. Because it seems like all it does is cosmic levels of pain. Like, yeah. I don't like we haven't seen it do anything else. like mother boxes and father boxes can both like boom tube and interpret information and share knowledge and stuff. And this thing is just like pain, cosmic unstoppable unexplainable pain Pain. like yep don't like that but we'll see we'll see how that goes i think i am ready to move on to the next episode unless you have more notes on this one no no if i do it's i don't the razor's edge they've well yeah they've they've blurred together enough having just like rewatched them a couple times back to back so if if it comes up and it is from the previous episode my apologies fair so Moving on to this one, I want to get my one negative thing out of my one genuine negative thing out of the way first so that I can then jump into all the fun stuff. Talking about episode 20, uh, to acknowledge my one genuinely kind of negative thing here before we move into everything else. This episode has a not great pronoun mistake thing that happens where people may, I'm sure, Many people may have noticed that both Rocket and Viking refer to Halo as she 
which is not correct anymore. And like, honestly, the first time through, it really threw me off. And I kept thinking, I kept trying to figure out why it had happened. Like, I know we in the, we were kind of talking about it among people on the Discord and in like other chats and whatnot of like, were they making a point that Rocket didn't know yet or something like that? Like, I wouldn't expect Viking to know, but maybe Rocket doesn't know either or what, what it was for. But a couple days after the episode, Greg made a post on Twitter admitting that he'd honestly just made a mistake during the writing process and nobody had caught it during editing or anything after that. And so it ended up in the final episode, uh, which isn't great and is honestly kind of really disappointing. Uh, And we're all human and we all make mistakes. And even big teams of creators, this kind of stuff happens. People notice like animation errors and stuff in cartoons all the time because sometimes things just slip through the cracks. But like this feels like more than that. And I know that it made a lot of people kind of really sad to just see it happen that like people make mistakes. Sometimes people mix up pronouns, especially if you're used to using one for a long time and then someone you know changes their pronouns and you have to adjust. It happens. But when it happens on the finished product of a scripted show, it can hurt. And I know that that's not great. And there's doesn't seem like there's much that can be done about it now other than an acknowledgement of the mistake, an apology for it, and a promise to do better in the future, all of which Greg did in said Twitter post that I'm referencing that you can find if you go scroll through his Twitter. But if there was a way to like fix this in a DVD release or something, or I don't know, even on HBO Max, that would be wonderful to see. And I know that that's probably not a thing that can happen just because of how much work has to go into making anything in animation happen. But, you know, send that wish out into the universe because just, yeah, hope nothing else like this happens in the season. And I totally get why a lot of people were annoyed about it because it sucks to see stuff like that happen. Yep. And I mean, and now we know what it was. And I think that's the silver lining to some degree is the unknown and then you know, there's a lot to be said about Greg taking the time and the effort and the everything that comes with the admission and also taking the blame. Um, because, you know, there are a lot of hands that it did pass through, but his willingness to take that as the showrunner, um, that I definitely commend him for doing that because it's it's not a small it's not a small thing that happened and it's certainly not a small thing to take um go ahead and take that blame for what has happened um and i like doing enough editing it's not a huge thing to change potentially but at the same time again with how many hands it does have to go through and the it might not happen which is which which may be what it is so totally get that totally get like yeah. But wanted to acknowledge that, wanted to talk about it because I know people have been talking about it uh, before we get into everything else. So what else happens in this episode? We I have a note here that just says, hey, look, it's that thing from the poster <laughs> that's about the uh, when the time sphere does the thing when it transports into Metron's vault. I was like, hey, that was on the poster. We didn't have context before. Nope, that was the exact thought I had, too, when it happened and it split. And I was just like, oh, OK, I see what happened now. But I also, yeah, I, I tried to invest too much thought into it. So then I, I will see because I was like, why are all the colors and like all the Green Lantern colors and Halo has colors and uh, OK, never mind. Stop it, Neil. <laughs> why is it so many colors? Because there are only so many colors, Neil. I don't know. I don't yep. think it's a Green Lantern thing. I think Halo stuff no, is no, related no. to like. Yeah. Mother box stuff, which is adjacent to father box stuff, which seems connected to Kaiser Thrall stuff. So like yep. there I think there is a thread. Uh but <laughs> um what else? I I know many people caught the Easter egg, but Black Canary's flower shop is called Sherwood Florist. Um uh, just let it just let it sink in. Let it live yep. live with that knowledge. It is a, yes. a canon thing from the comics of in continuities where Dinah Lance owns a flower shop, it is generally called Sherwood Florist. Uh, 
And that was an amusing, amusing catch. And apparently she sees clients up in the room above. Yeah. Him. And then she also has um, a black canary on her desk. And for a second, I couldn't quite figure out what it was that was framed behind her, but it's a police badge. Uh. Um, and I, my assumption would be that it it's either hers, which I feel is the less likely choice. Yeah. Um, more, more likely it is that of her father's. That makes sense to me. I feel like we have never seen anything in no. the show to even vaguely imply that Dinah was ever a police officer but it yeah. is part of her dad's backstory uh which i would believe and of course the the award for best supporting role goes to the clipboard because that's where that's that's what it always is if there's a clipboard in the episode it immediately gets best supporting role from me i do however speaking of the clipboard i do like the the detail the little detail that Dinah's just making check marks on a blank piece of paper because she's <laughs> just so waiting good. him out uh she's like i'll just do what you expect me to do until you start actually answering my questions and how it's communicated so perfectly through just that one shot where it's just line of check marks next to nothing i was because at first second i was like that's a weird way to animate that and then i went oh i see what you've done <laughs> I get the joke. Yep. You get, you get a hint of it where it shows the one check mark and it doesn't have anything near it or around it. You're like, oh, okay. And then you see, it and you're like, oh, okay. I. Mm-hmm. But also the therapy session is so good. Uh, it's got a bunch of really cool little visual callbacks to Disordered, to the original Black Canary therapy session from everything like, the water fixture on her desk there is a waterfall in the background of the disordered therapy uh scene rooms which i had not caught until like several people had made like side by side comparison things on twitter and stuff i was like oh, that's good that's a good one like i was like i get the chair setup is the same and everything but that one i was like oh that's a nice that's a nice touch um but just also just it's really well written and it's really interesting and it provides a good new angle on everything Beast Boy's been going through rather than just rehashing things. Because I feel like sometimes with this kind of scene, especially after we've had this whole arc set up so far, there is a danger of just having Beast Boy recite everything we've seen him do this season, which would be extremely boring and feel unnecessary from a story perspective of like, yeah, I know, I saw all that. But when you get to the heart of that, where Beast Boy admits that he feels at fault for everything that's happened yeah. ever. You're like, oh, I hadn't gotten there yet kind of thing. Like I hadn't thought that was the problem until he said it. And the second he says it, I go, oh, that makes perfect sense. Tell me more. Say more words right now. And that makes it interesting and good. And it's cathartic. And I'm so glad we are getting Beast Boy help. It has taken all season. We are 20 episodes in. Uh but thank goodness for Black Canary. Yeah. And I, if, the other thing is, like, I'm so used to a certain version of Beast Boy from Greg Sipes that it's so great to, to also have this version of Beast Boy from the same voice actor and it have such that emotional range to, to make that scene work. Yeah. Because normally the scene is just up to 11 and just zany as possible with Teen Titans Go and that overall version of Beast Boy. And there's certainly elements, um, uh, emotional beats that that occur in those, but like not to this degree, I would say. And so I, I was just, it was just good. It's a good scene. And I'm glad we got there. I do, I we have now set up the idea of whether or not Forager is gonna stay on new genesis or come back to earth uh and i did laugh quite hard at rocket thinking that she's being the voice of reason by just being like what you've known this girl for two days and laughed additionally harder when basically everyone else in the room goes no no let let the bug speak he's got a good point here yeah. She's like, am I the only sane person here? I, but also, I do like everyone having there being an in-universe reason for this not to feel weird kind of thing. Because a lot of a lot of different shows, a lot of different genres do the thing of like 
meeting somebody on an adventure. And what do you do? Do you go back with your team that you've known forever? Or do you stay with this new person? And what do you do about that? And them actually writing into the universe of like, this would be extremely normal for the culture uh, forager is from. I'm like, thank you. Even just one line makes it not feel as silly. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and you, I mean, certainly we're playing with, with time in a very interesting way, not only from the aspect of two days before, one day before, um, but also, you know, Jay mentioning, you know, he's turned 102, but also knew the instant that it, you know, that he, he met the person he was meant to be with. And so from his, from his lens, it's just like, oh yeah, this, this totally makes sense. This is the one thing I understand that the, that the bug man keeps saying, I get it. <laughs> no, for it. Forager he keeps saying and, Forager, and I'm very, very confused, but this, this I understand. Forager and Jay Garrick are apparently good friends, and I yes. like it. Uh, what? And they, are support- <laughs> they understand each other. Jay Garrick's only thing is like, okay, the name thing can be a bit confusing, but other than that, I understand this bug. Well, you also have uh, Bear, who who's like, oh, awkward. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just a little bit over 16,000. <laughs> Give it take a few decades. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's interesting to see those things. Because I also think of like uh going like going back to go forward, you know, does does Kilowog not mention the four years passing or more about it? Because, you know, the the search for Aya could take decades and that's okay because like that they're races, you know, races in this universe that are longer lived. So what what is four years? Also just get a time sphere, solve every <laughs> <laughs> solve your problems. every problem cannot be solved with time sphere neil that's a dangerous okay. road it is uh but we did speaking of time sphere we did get confirmation that the tracer being placed on the ruction cell is macom which is i think what a lot of us thought we're like that's the most likely option is something something time travel something something macom uh, but it's nice to finally have the context and go, indeed, it is something, something, time travel, something, something, macabre. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> to to go to the Phantom Zone uh, for a minute, when you, got a, when you got a bunch of people chanting about the need to work to preserve the prosperity of the all-powerful leader's family, that feels very culty. Yeah. You got... You got st- well, I mean, the yes, it just is. I mean, you, you, it's not. It's like, are you going to try to argue that that doesn't? Feel no, cultish? no, 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 no. It's more of just a hesitation to really walk walk this road much 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 further because, like, it, it's such a weird conversation. But but the idea of using terms like son, my boy, family. I mean, the the whole road is is trying to indoctrinate Connor as quickly as possible, but also as as Druzad mentions, trying to play the long game because he could potentially see the option of it not working. Um, so, and it's like the thing. The, what I will say is like some of that stuff to me can just like the like in a in a slightly different context. Just calling somebody like "oh my boy," "welcome to the family" kind of thing. Those can be just non non creepy things depending on the context that can just be you know being friendly cultural stuff that to me is less worrisome than just like oh we got a we got a planned musical number that sounds very ominous and threatening uh don't love that uh <laughs> yeah i don't i will say i don't know that much about like zod lore so i'm just going on vibes at the moment oh yeah yeah no no it's all pretty standard stuff they, uh, it, or, <laughs> like, it, like if i'm way off base feel free no, to call me out no, no, or no, tell no, me no, to no, retake no. something uh no no because because the whole thing is like you, you know at that uh, and i i feel like because again with the the time of things i think this this group of kryptonians is from before Krypton blows up. Yes. That's my perception. Like it's that not the I believe is time. what ha- I believe that has what has been implied. Yeah, so it's not the second time that they've been placed into the fan- into the Phantom Zone after getting let out because they're like we can't leave you there forever. Oh no, we let you out and you did terrible things. We should put you back in there. Oh no. Um and yes. then we'll leave you forever. But the yeah, the the stuff that's there, like some some of the iterations of like 
Zod's inner circle, though those are there, and you you get a lot of their names from the credits. Um, again, that's that's not a deep dive I necessarily want to do, but there is definitely someone from the House of L as part of it already, um, as part of that group. So I thought I noticed named- that. I didn't notice it in the credits, but I kept thinking I saw somebody in the background where I was like, "That's that looks like an S shield." Uh, that is indeed but, interesting. But yeah, so there, there. I think there are um, like f- at least five houses, Kryptonian houses, represented in that group. So that's also to speak that um, how good Zod is at getting people to join. Interesting. We'll see more. Uh, I also I do I do love Connor having flashback associations of his family and friends as he tries to seemingly piece together some sort of memory. Uh, that's yeah. good because we need to get that boy out of speaking in monotone Cadmus syllables because those those are scary. This that that's that's early season one Connor speech patterns. Those aren't good. Yeah, I noted that as well that it, in. Uh... Obviously, everyone involved did a good job of making it. It was there, but it wasn't the full monotone. That was really, you know, it was great voice acting, voice, great directing and everything in between. I also just was like, oh, bummer. That feel that felt like it helped him kneel before Zod, not help him yeah. not kneel. Yeah, um, that second one, oops. I was like, yeah, the association of getting confused on people building things and going, uh-huh. I have a vague memory of that, but no context for what I was building something for. Just I've put that rocks it was on good. other rocks before. I put rocks on <laughs> other rocks before, and it was good. I remember yeah. having positive association with, and thus... And family, uh, and thus will run with this because of associations. And I'm like, no, no, we got to save this boy. Got to get him out of the Phantom Zone. Get him to Black Canary. <laughs> yeah. Also, I realized my next note is, never trust Metron. Come, come with me. Someone is stealing my stuff, and I really don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> like, here's... The, that's the problem where you're like yeah. that's a very fair reading of that but also he is right in the other context uh, too of like i'm like it is true that it's not good for them to be getting that i'm yeah he's he's this season's dr jace <laughs> there you go <laughs> oh i don't know no I'm, I'm so pleased with that statement that I had not thought of until this very moment, and I'm glad that I said it out loud. This is a rabbit hole we can't go near. Nope, um, we will not. Well, I, I, I mean, it is interesting because just to say that like there, there is a lot of benefit for what Metron does and what Metron cur- has, because that was definitely overwhelming to see his vault and the scale at which it exists and has a baby sun eater defending it no less is that a thing it sounds like a thing but i don't know anything about it oh the the sun eater yes yeah no, no the, again that that's that's some kryptonian lore um yeah. and uh, yeah the baby version and then typically I, I think superman has one usually like locked away in the um, fortress of solitude um yeah baby sun eater terrifying adult sun eater sun real real bad yeah yep okay yeah no i agree with all that metron has a lot of vibes of just occasionally doing the right thing for the wrong reason like i agree with you that if it ends up being the thing of people are stealing my stuff i don't like that he (laughs) he gets to the part of like we need to stop these people and everyone's like yeah because they're gonna wreck the entire timeline and release some very dangerous people into the world he's like no because they they took my stuff yeah i want to put my stuff back (laughs) very agree with you there my last note here is foragers romeo and juliet speech is top tier quite good and made funnier by the fact that jason spizak actually used to do shakespeare readings on youtube uh, back in the day, like right after invasion, it was my first called, thought. Mm-hmm. Uh, while he reads the classics, uh, <laughs> he also did a couple razor reads the classics that were also quite good. That were very, that were very fun. And getting to see him do one as forager is very, very sweet. <laughs> well, I also love the you know cha- changing the pronouns to be forager. Is yes. Also, 
Yes. Makes it that much more fun. Uh, I also realized when I put on uh, subtitles that every instance of moon is replaced with moons, plural, because there are at least two moons on yes. Genesis. Oh, that's good. <laughs> it was good. It was very sweet. Um, it was just good. And it was a decent rendition of a, of a Shakespeare monologue. I'm like, yeah, you go, Forager. I let, I'm going to headcanon that... Uh, Forager read Romeo and Juliet in as part of high school, as part of Happy Harbor High School, and just kind of memorized part of it. Uh, are we going to add a new book to the to the world? Come on. Yeah, Romeo and Juliet is canon now. We can add it to the Young Justice Library. <laughs> it's the problem of going, most books probably exist in the Young Justice yeah. universe, but I like having my list of like ones that have been explicitly referenced. Yes. I mean, because in the in a therapy session behind her was an entirely full bookcase. So yes, uh, 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 of three books, <laughs> just different editions of the seven books that exist in Young Justice. But do you have anything else to add about this episode before we move on to some crash in the mud? No, just like I said in the beginning, Mantis is is clear, clearly the MVP for that team. <laughs> yeah, it's nice after like a couple of episodes of being like. What is he even doing here? What's he going to do? He hasn't really done much. And then being like, I will pick up everyone, drag you back into the bubble uh, and operate the time sphere correctly. Yeah, I'm going to. I have four arms for a reason. And two of them are to hold up the thing that we were looking for. And the other two to just look like I am having a joyous time doing. But that means we will crash the mode. We don't have a lot, but but we should crash. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. So, in Crash in the Mode, we will be discussing potential storylines running through our heads based on the episodes released at the time of recording. So, this Crash in the Mode is based on episodes 1 through 20 and the trailer. So, my one little... I don't have that much Crash in the Mode this this week other than uh, just pointing out how Beast Boy offhandedly says Connor's hanging out with Wally now. I'm sure they're doing great. And it's supposed to be him, you know, bearing those emotions and not addressing his anything and all of that and that being everything going on there. But also, since we've shown, we've kind of vaguely implied that Wally might also be trapped in the Phantom Zone. There is textual evidence to support this claim right now. Is He doesn't realize how correct he is at the moment. It is a super fun line to have. I don't, I mean, at this point, I have no idea what's happening. Yeah. In, in that, I don't, I don't know if he's actually in the Phantom Zone. We all commit to the idea that he is alive. Yes. It's the, but, you know, when the only other person that we've seen in the Phantom Zone that had the same setup as everybody else, the same color scheme, was well, Kid Flash, I might have some questions. But, you know, maybe not. Maybe that's just how Connor perceives the concept of someone being dead in the phantom zone. I don't know. We won't know until we know, but wanted to point yes. it out. Now, Neil, what do you have to share? Um, so the eye, the Emerald eye of Ekron, <laughs> um, is apparently one of the most powerful weapons to ever exist in the DC universe. And it provides its owner a variety of powers, similar to that of a green lantern power ring. Um, so that's what uh, Lorzad just pockets real quick. Like, it's nothing. I'm sure that won't come up. Definitely not. Not at all. Definitely nope. not. Uh, Terrifying. One of those things that happens on the show where I go, that's something. Uh, <laughs> and just continue on my way uh, until it is explained to me. The other thing is I wonder about, like, the combination of the Phantom Zone projector and the Time Sphere. You know, if, if you have the functioning Time Sphere, where are you going to? Nope. When are you going to go and use it? It was, yep. is my other thought. I also, yeah, because that is my question here. Like, I feel like it's been set up. Maybe I'm misreading this, but it feels like it's been set up as Lorzad being, a, why wait until the 31st century? Why don't I just release my parents now? And I'm like, okay, but doesn't that mess up your entire timeline? But genuinely, like, wouldn't that erase him from the timeline or something or wouldn't it cause a paradox like he would be existing at the same time as himself if he released his parents and stayed or would he release his parents in the 21st century and then teleport back to wherever what it i don't understand what his plan is it just currently to me at least feels 
both very dangerous and vaguely flawed. Yeah, does he stop existing because of it? I mean, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I have no idea. That is that is my thought. That was my first thought as well. It's like, well, this doesn't seem like it's great for you. I mean, I guess it can be, but then you just you stop looking at the timeline you came from because you look at the adjustments when Bart made changes as to what did or didn't happen. But like it's the problem that like Bart hasn't run into this problem and if it would be a problem yet because he is still currently because time travel older than his parents. <laughs> True. So he has not Bart has not existed on a timeline in which there are two Barts yet. Yet. Uh if and when that comes to pass, who knows what'll happen to Bart. Yeah, but but Bart seemed to imply that something knocked him out of the out of phase with the timeline. It, like that was like kind of the terminology because I also think of like the button that apparently is just inside the time sphere to stay out of sync so then like no one can see you because you're out of sync with the time that you're there yeah. and then the implication that like you could resync but Bart can't. Yeah. Yeah, I think Bart's thing was the thing was again uh the magic words of chronoton radiation uh yes that just means you're immune to the difference in time travel the difference is whatever you do to the timeline doesn't affect you so maybe there he can't erase himself but we'll see i don't know i are you telling me that time travel can be confusing when we don't know yes. all of the details on how it works no yeah, maybe well the other thing is Speaking of time travel, and again, you've already seen it, dear listener. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you listened to us before you watched the episode. That That's a nice feeling. I don't know if you do that, but <laughs> if you did, um, then the other thing is the trailer clearly shows a, a huge fight that happens. At, and like we don't we haven't seen any of that. So. Oh, yeah, you're right. Oh, <laughs> I'd forget. I I have like purpose. There's been a little bit of me that's like had not been rewatching the trailer because I want to keep yeah. being surprised by things. But like I had forgotten that. Yeah, we're gonna get we're gonna get Laura Zod fighting Orion. We think based on like shapes in trailers. Um, yeah, and we haven't seen that yet. You're right. What? Well, um, and he'll fight. And based off of the like random French promotional material. No, no, I won't. I'm just saying we also could potentially know other people that he would fight, which is crazy to me that we could know that. There you go. Either either way, I guess it'll be the last the last episode in the arc, assuming that they all hold the same number and that we'd give an extra an extra episode to the last arc. But that's it. That's all the crashing I have. (laughs) That's all you got. I don't have much more to add either. Just. Just a lot of lot of stuff up in the air. We'll see how it all falls. <laughs> Nothing ominous on the horizon at all, given everything everyone said in every direction. It'll be fine. We'll see. It's fine. <laughs> and with that, I think we can Zeta out of the Watchtower. Thank you for spending some time with us here today. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crash in the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, on our website, CrashInTheMode.com. And if that isn't enough for you, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. Ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those. And if you are able to support us monetarily and would like to do so, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crash in the mode. Even $1 a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. 
Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Thank you.